Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens weekly webinar series, Let's Talk Gardens. Today, we're going to talk about how do we keep track of our gardens with photography and get some tips on how to make a difference so that you can remember what you have in the garden and what you don't. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the manager of education and collections at Smithsonian Gardens and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker. But before we do that, let me share some housekeeping tips with you. We will not be answering questions during the presentation, so please do not raise your hand. Please put your questions in the chat box, which is up on your screen. You should be able to see where you press to be able to open up the chat box and put your questions in that. We also are going to uh, share some polls with you this time. This is the first time we've tried this, but we wanted to get some information from you. So when the poll comes up, we'll direct you on how to answer the, the questions, and then we'll see what the answers are. Also, for the optimal conditions for viewing this webinar, we ask that you close all browser windows, except this one that you're watching the, uh, the video on, the presentation on. So without further ado, let me introduce Hanali Latte. Hanali is a photographer that works with our living collections to take pictures of our trees and orchids and the lovely uh, plants that we have in our gardens. So Hanali, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm gonna, I won't go invisible yet. I want you to, I want to do the poll together. So you introduce why, what you're trying to get from this poll and then I'll, I'll publish it. Right. So, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Cindy. Um, so the first poll is just a question to see where everyone is at with their photography practice. And the reason I was interested in, in learning where everyone is coming from is that then I can sort of customize the how I explain everything um, based on the experience of all of you. So go ahead and do your poll. It looks like I can do my poll as well. So, um, let's see. I hope you're not going to check I'm a novice. Help. <laughs> <laughs> that might skew the results a bit. So it might. Oh, it looks like a lot of them are novices, but there are some that have some skills that they want to build upon. So they have some experience, but they want some help on learning how to do it. Um, some amateur experts, which uh, that's why I, I put the questions, two different questions in there. So I want to know if you're an amateur expert or if you actually are a photographer that gets paid like Hanalei. So, okay, so we are, it looks like you've got a real good group that has some experience, but they want to build their skills. So I'm going to end the poll now and I'll disappear and then continue on with your presentation, please, Hanalei. Okay, all right. So, oh, I have to share results there. They couldn't oh. see. Them. <laughs> oh, right. I, was I say, did not I know see. that. <laughs> the things okay. that you learn. Okay, so there's the results. All and right. you can see where we are. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. I want to close that. Okay, so let's get started. We... Okay. Um, so I just want to give you a brief introduction of who I am so you know who is giving you the advice today <laughs> to improve your photography. Um, I'm a photo grad from Rochester Institute of Technology and have spent the last 18 years working as a professional photographer, mostly in the DC region. Um, I've exhibited my work worldwide and been published by familiar titles such as like National Geographic and the Washington Post. And as Cindy said, I am currently working with Smithsonian Gardens to photograph their living collections. And um, we've, we're starting with the trees. So I just want to give you a little snippet of what we've been doing with the tree collection. Um, and you'll see several trees throughout this presentation that are examples of of what we've been working together on. And it will be a great resource for anyone who is interested in trees and um, photography and learning more about uh, what you can see on the National Mall. So 
we're going to talk about today. Um, I wanted to sort of manage expectations a little bit and just say, you know, we have a very limited time together um, to cover a very wide um, subject matter. So we're going to focus in today on uh, lighting and composition as it pertains to um, image making. It does not matter what kind of camera you are using. These principles will apply to all of those um, pieces of equipment. Um, what we will not be covering today is specific gear, uh, lens. I might touch on lenses a little bit, but not too much. Um, and we aren't gonna talk about any like technical aspects such as exposure and that sort of thing. My goal here is just to inspire you to start seeing your world from a photographic perspective. So to do that, we're gonna start with lighting and talking about observing light in your daily life. And then we're going to move on to crafting an image that um, speaks to you and your viewers. So let's just jump right in. So understanding light. Um, it may sound abstract a little bit, but it is the key to making better pictures. Once you can sort of define light sources and understand what they do to your subject, um, you'll, you'll start to um, be able to make more interesting pictures because you can utilize what you know. So this you can do without a camera. You, anyone can do this at any time of day while you're drinking coffee in your sun porch or in your kitchen. You can start observing light in your daily life. And to do this, we're gonna start asking questions, right? So we're gonna ask, how does the light look at different times of day? Is it warm or cool? Is it bright or dark? Or what does it do to certain surfaces when it's reflected off of them? How does light sculpt your subject? What is it, where's the texture coming from? And what color is it at different times of year even? Because in the winter, light tends to be a little bit cooler. And I'm talking natural light here but it tends to be a little bit cooler. And then once, as you start to do this, you'll start to build a library in your little brain about all of these observations you've made, and then you can start using them in your daily life. Um, I cannot go anywhere without defining the light in that space. It's an obsession, um, it's a practice, it's something I will always do, and it's actually, gives me a little bit of a chance to be more present in my space um, at whether I'm photographing or not. So we're going to just briefly go over the, some of the characteristics of light that we're going to cover today. Um, we are going to look at pictures, so don't worry. Um, so the first one is just the direction. Where is it coming from? Is it from the le left to right, top to bottom, that sort of thing? Um, how bright is it? What is the intensity of that light? The sun is a very bright light source, but what about when it's behind a cloud? Is that bright or dark or intense or not? Um, and then we're gonna talk about color and then size. Like what is the size of your light source? For example, the sun, you think of the sun as this humongous thing, but it's actually a very small light source. Um, it's directional and it's intense, but when it's behind a cloud, the sun becomes a much larger light source, if that makes sense. We'll, we'll get into it. So for example, with this image, it was shot on a partly cloudy afternoon um, on the side of a mountain in Norway, actually. And the nice thing about cloudy day, like partly cloudy days, is you can just sit still for a little bit and the light will change. So this is the same image that is shot on a cloudy day. Um, the sun is behind the clouds. You kind of have this nice even lighting. It's very balanced. Um, there's a lot of detail in between like your highlights and your shadows. But if I waited like five minutes and shot this image, so the sun came out from behind the clouds and just went streaking across the scene. And all of a sudden you lose some of the details in your highlights here and your shadows on the tree bark. Let me go back to that first one just to compare. See how it's much more muted. The intensity of the light is much lower. The color is a little bit cooler. Um, the direction is the same, 
but the size of that light source is much larger. So it just creates a, a, a bigger, um, more even scene, I suppose. And then, as opposed to this one, where you can really see the light streaking across and making big shadows and that sort of thing. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm starting, when I'm talking about noticing light in your life. This one was morning sun, early in the day. So the sun is low, it's warm. Um, the sun was slightly diffused by some fog. So your shadows are there and they're, and they're defined, but they're a little soft. There's a lot of detail in, in the texture here. Um, you can really see all of the color in the butterfly wings. Um, your, sh your highlights aren't blown out like they were here. Hopefully you can see the difference. It's so weird not to be seeing people in person for this sort of thing. But um, so that's an example of morning sun where it's warm, it's low, and the shadows are long. This is also an image of morning sun. However, it's dappled. It's going through lots of foliage to reach these leaves, right? So this fern is, I'm kind of right inside that fern photographing some of the details on the inside rather than the entire plant. And we're gonna see this fern again. So remember this image for later in the program. And here's midday sun. So one of, one of the things you hear a lot when you're learning photography is that midday sun is not good. And that's not true in every situation. Um, the idea that the, usually is being pushed is that you don't wanna sh photograph people in midday sun because the um, shadows on their face will be really um, sharp and not really flattering. However, with gardens and trees, Midday sun is perfectly fine. Um, it is contrasty, you can, but you can still get out there and make some interesting images um, in the midday. So don't be afraid of that. Um, it's something that I hear a lot and I just wanna um, quell that thought a little bit. Um, this was also shot for, um, this was actually shot for the, National, uh, the um, Smithsonian Gardens tree collection. This is at the Museum of African American History and Culture. And this was at midday. This, I looked at the photo information and I shot this at noon, which is not usually a time that people think of to be out photographing. Um, however, with trees, that's a great time for it to light up the whole tree. So don't be afraid. Um, there is times that you can, you can get out anytime and photograph a garden. Cloudy days. So that's another thing that you hear a lot. People don't wanna photograph or I have clients who are like, oh, it's gonna be cloudy. I don't wanna, can we move the shoot? It's like, no, let's, let's photograph on a cloudy day when this, the light is really um, diffused and soft and the colors are really bright and bold and saturated. Um, cloudy days are great days to be in the garden and pho to photograph um, close-ups and flowers and, and color. They're not as great for photographing trees, however, because the cloudy sky will be way too bright for your darker tree. It wouldn't be enough light to, to brighten the tree. So you can always find something to photograph in the garden, no matter the weather or the time of day. And this image was also shot, um, this was shot in the shade of my house actually. And I use, um, this is the only equipment I'm gonna show you today. I use a little reflector like this. This is actually just a piece of foam core. And you can use that to just reflect a little bit of the, the light back into your shadow areas, just to create a little bit more, see how it's, it's brighter than you know, the shadows back here. So I used a little reflector to just pop some light back up into into the um, hydrangea flower there. And as you build your, your lighting vocabulary, you'll, you'll start to see how you can improve um, the lighting in your picture just by using some simple tools like a reflector or moving yourself to a different angle where the light is maybe a little bit more interesting. Okay, and then 
This image was also shot in the morning. I do like to shoot in the morning. I find the garden to be very magical in the morning. Um, this is actually one of my house plants that sits in front of um, an east facing window. And I just photographed the sun sort of coming through the leaf. And that is a great tool to be able to show all the veins and, and the texture of foliage. So I just wanted to make sure I showed that as well as, as an option for you um, when you're out photographing um, foliage, especially. All right, so I'm gonna give you homework. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna ask you to, over the course of the next week or so, pick a plant in your garden or your house or an object that you're interested in and just spend a week observing it. You don't necessarily need to photograph it. That's bonus points, um, but visit it at different times of day Visit it on cloudy days or sunny days or rainy days. And then ask yourself, how is the light affecting the plant's color, the plant's shape, and its texture? See what happens in the background. Is it, um, is it, is the background really, really bright and the plant is really dark or vice versa? And then start paying attention to what is most pleasing to you. What do you like? Do you like a cloudy day or do you like, do you prefer a um, sunny, bright, sunny day? These are all things that you can use and just add to your toolbox um, so that when, when you're out shooting, you can look for those um, lighting situations um, in the garden because they're all there, no matter what time of day or how cloudy or sunny it is. You can always find something um, in your toolbox to use. So that's your homework. I hope you um, take part in it. There will be no grading or follow-up, so <laughs> just, just um, take my advice and try it. All right, part two. So we're going to start crafting the image. Now that we have a little bit of an idea of lighting, we're going to start taking control of the environment that we find ourselves in and using um, the tools of composition. So before but before you do that, before you use composition, um, I want you to just go to the garden and just sit there and look around and ask yourself, what do I want to capture? Why? And what is it, the most important feature that's popping out to me right now? And then where do I need to stand in order to highlight that feature? Okay. And to do that, you're going to use some tools in a toolbox. And I call this my compositional toolbox because not every tool is right for the job, but um, they're all useful. So we're going to go really quickly and then I'm going to show you lots of examples um, of all the tools that I use when I'm in the garden. So the first one is the rule of thirds and despite the word rule, it's not a rule, it's a guideline, it's an idea. So and that's the rule of thirds is basically dividing your image into sections and then placing in its how you place your subject in the image. Don't worry, I'll show you. Um, the next one is point of view and that covers where you shoot the image from and that can add meaning and character to your subject. Leading lines is um, useful for adding a 3D quality to your 2D image. And then drawing your image through, uh, drawing your viewer through your image. And then framing is, I used, I use that frequently to help draw attention to my subject by blocking out other parts of the image, anything that would be distracting. Um, patterns and symmetry are really fun to play with in gardens because there's lots of repetition going on um, and you can use it to create rhythm and texture. And then scale is all about using an element in your image of known size, like a human being or a butterfly, um, something that most people know the relative size of. And by using that in your image, it will help the viewer understand the size of other things in your image. So let's, let's get into it here. So this is the rule of thirds. A lot of cameras actually have this option so that when you're looking through the frame, um, you can have your little rule of thirds grid 
And the idea for the rule of thirds is that you would place your subject sort of in the intersections of these lines. The other way you can use it is placing your horizon line on either the horizontal or the vertical lines. So depending on whether you're shooting horizontally or vertically, that's, that's how you would divide the image. And the idea is that it would create a, um, a balance within the image so that the, the viewer will go straight to your subject and then also start looking around the rest of the image. So let's see it in action. So with this image, because we all see a bird, right? We all know what a bird is. We recognize what that is. I placed it up in that top third right here on purpose because the bird is pointed this direction. So your eye is going to go here because it's familiar. And then you're kind of going to go see what it's maybe looking at. And then you might come down here and see this blue in the water. And oh, look at the reflection. You can see the eye here. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then you go right back up to that bird, right? So it's the, the idea is that you, you make the image dynamic by balancing it in a certain way. And the rule of thirds many times works really well for that. So it's just a, a tool that you can use um, when you're not really sure. Just go ahead and try it out. Here's another rule of thirds um, where the flower is centered, you know, this way, but it's not centered like straight in the middle. So by having the flower up here, it, it makes your eye kind of go there first and then sort of move down and see if there's anything else going on. In this image, there's not really much else going on, but um, it's, you, you could use this if it was a person. So a classic portrait picture of a, a face would be set up in this way. So you would have the face sort of top center and then the rest of the body below. And the other thing I wanna mention in this image is the point of view. So this is like a classic side portrait view of a flower. Whereas this next image is the same exact flower, but from straight down. And the color palette is completely different because in this image, now you can see the foliage that is um, part of this plant. Whereas here, all you're seeing is sort of, is actually the, just the mulch behind the flower, which is a nice effect. It makes for a very clean image, but this is the same flower. So start moving around your, obje your object and finding different ways to, to show it, um, it actually becomes really fun to, to play that way. And this also works with the rule of thirds. Continuing with point of view, if you remember the fern from the lighting section, um, this is the same fern, it's just I moved. I sat down on the ground and looked up into the plant and this image is slightly chaotic and I kind of like it. Um, Whereas this image, I moved again and found like a whole new view of this leaf, which is, it makes it more exciting to me to like look for different things of the same image um, or the same subject. And, and this is, gardens are a great place to do that because you don't have a person waiting for you <laughs> to move them or you move around them. Plants aren't talking back to you. so you can go ahead and really explore. So this image uses a whole bunch of them, a bunch of tools, um, its point of view. And the, the reason I wanted to call attention to this image is that by, I literally moved three inches lower and got this bloom separated from these. So when they were all together, you really couldn't, it was just too busy. You didn't really know where to look. So just by moving three inches lower, it didn't make a big difference like to me, but it made a huge difference for the image. And the other thing that you find when you change your perspective just slightly is that all of a sudden, oh, there's an ant right here crawling up the, the stem. 
I wouldn't have seen that if I hadn't moved lower because that ant would have been down in here and the contrast wouldn't have been as um, defined. Here I can see it because it's a black ant against a very light sky. So sometimes you discover things you never thought you would when you move very little. So I just want to really drive that home. It doesn't, you don't have to move a lot to, to change your image significantly. So this is another example of point of view, like I'm looking straight up. But what made this image a little different is that I used leading lines of um, the leading lines tool to carry you up to the canopy instead of just having you go there automatically. So you're following this as you look into this image. And I, I did this because the bark of um, a paper birch is, is a significant um, component of the tree, like it's, a, it's an identifier. So by using that to draw your eye up into the canopy, um, you're able to identify the tree very quickly and it just sort of makes you go right there. So that's an example of leading lines that is maybe a little less traditional. Whereas this image is very traditional leading lines like you use a pathway that just takes you right directly into the image. And the great thing with leading lines is that many gardeners actually use that when they design their landscapes. So like this image at Versailles, I mean, they made this image for me. Like I just was there. <laughs> so that's a tool that I use frequently. Um, leading lines is something I use very frequently when I'm shooting in a garden because it's already there. They've done it for me. Thank you, horticulturists. Um, the other thing in this image that I'm using is rule of thirds because my horizon is right on that bottom third. If it had been more centered, the image might just be too static. It would have given equal weight to the sky and the ground and I found the sky and the, the trees more important in this image. So moving on. This is the Ripley Garden right in DC. I shot this actually on Monday or Tuesday this week. Um, and this is leading lines, classic leading lines. You've got a path going through. Thank you for designing it that way. And then you have the street lights going down and the fencing going down and then the building. So I'm using a lot of leading lines in this image to, to draw you into this really beautiful space. All right, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about framing. So everyone knows that building right here. Um, and everyone knows it's a humongous building. Well, I was next to this tree and I thought the tree was just amazing. So I figured I would use um, the tree to frame up the capital and just make it look smaller and then have the tree become the subject of the image whereas the capital um, everyone recognizes that, but then you might go to that first, but then you're going to go up into the branches of that tree and just see how like chaotic and beautiful they are. I'm um, using rule of thirds again in this image and um, the scale of the Capitol building to juxtapose against the very large tree. And of course the tree isn't larger than the Capitol. I'm just closer to it than I am to the Capitol. Here's another example of framing, again, in the Ripley Garden. Um, I'm using all the foliage. Um, I just sort of got right in there. I didn't get into the beds, but I just got right up to an edge and, and looked directly into the arts and industry building. And then I found this guy just pacing while he was on his phone. I just kind of waited until he got to a place where he was separated from like this tree or the lamppost, just to add a sense of scale so that you kind of could figure out the size of that building and the, the environment surrounding him. And this is an image um, that I shot for the tree collection. It is a very beautiful Southern Magnolia at the Hirschhorn Museum. And normally when I'm doing this tree collection work, I'm, I'm not including people in it, but this tree is just so enormous that I left this little family over here in the corner having a picnic just to give it a little bit of scale because if you didn't have that there, it would be hard to, 
understand just how enormous this tree is. So um, using people is a great way to add, add some interest and scale to your, to your image. All right, patterns and symmetry. So I really love patterns and symmetry in photography and in garden spaces, and they really go hand in hand. You can, um, there, there are so many ways to pho photograph patterns and symmetry, and, it, and it's super fun. This image, I just love all the different layers. You have the white on the bark, which maybe is a, is a pest control. You have this very funny, like, um, shape of a tree and then you have this great flat brick wall um, behind it and then you've got a little row of of plantings in front of the trees there's just so much um order to this image that i just it's it's one of my favorites <laughs> and then you can do it with just plants so finding um you know sort of order among the chaos and that's a great way to, to document some, to, some symmetry and patterns. Same here, like this image, um, I'm kind of breaking the rule of thirds rule because I put my horizon just about in the center. But I did that because I was more interested in these dancing trees. I just thought they were so beautiful and elegant that I wanted the, all of the attention to be on how the form of the tree and how they're kind of just in this environment um, dancing. I just, I look at this image and I think of them dancing. I don't know about anyone else, but I think it's really interesting um, capture. Okay, so now we're gonna do another poll, Cindy. Um, and it's gonna be about, um, you're gonna choose which compositional tool that we are using in this image. And Cindy, go ahead with the poll. I'm not sure how that pops up. You will wait for that. I'm, I'm here. I'm trying to figure out how to make it pop up too. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, okay. There, it's launched. So go ahead and uh, please put your answers in the box and I'll move this over so that you can see the picture so it's not blocked. I answered, but oh. I, I kind of know the answer. <laughs> I hope you know the answer. <laughs> Can't wait to see when we finally have things slow down. Now that I know that I have to hit this button before you see the answers, uh, it's really fun. So we have 76%, 77, we're almost there. We have 184 people attending today. So looks like most of them have answered. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Okay. And share the results. Ah, and then okay. you can see, so they're saying all the above. They um, are correct. Ah, they are terrific. Perfect. Yay. Well, I will stop sharing and I will be quiet. So tell us why it's all of the above. <laughs> okay, so it's definitely rule of thirds because we have the bee in the flower right in that third region. We are using framing by having sort of out of focus flowers wrapped around here and here. And I threw in scale because we all kind of know the size of a bee um, in general terms. So I thought scale also applied. So good job, everyone. That's pretty cool. Apparently you are paying attention, which is great. All right, so we're gonna go on. Oops, let me just select what I'm working on here. Okay, so now that we've talked about all the tools and the rules of composition, I'm gonna tell you to break them. Um, not every tool is right for the job. Um, the idea here is more to define what you want to say and then pick the tool that helps you say it. Um, be creative, move around, get your exercise, stretch out a little bit, and then um, just trust your creative eye. Um, if something looks interesting to you, photograph it. It's, there's no rule here. It's just, um, these are just ways to, to help organize your image. All right, so moving on. So now we're gonna just 
briefly talk about how to approach garden photography um, by using storytelling. And um, I just want to point out that photography is just so much more than just documenting an object. Um, go a little deeper, um, figure out what makes this plant or tree or garden unique and define that. And then um, think about what happens in the garden, what's growing, um, who visits, and uh, how does it change. And then think about how, if you're photographing a plant, how does it relate or benefit from its environment? So just start thinking about those things when you're out shooting. And um, one of the things that I always start with is I just to start by establishing my sense of place. And like I said before, um, it's important to be present and to um, spend a little time in the garden before you start photographing. It's the same as observing light. Um, just sit, on, like this bench would be a perfect place. I think I might have sat in the, on this bench before I made this image. Just listening and looking and enjoying. It's a great meditative experience if you're looking for um, a meditation practice, um, but it's really important to not just walk into a space and start taking pictures um, because you, you're going to miss a lot. So just spend a little time in the space, looking around, um, enjoying how the, the garden design has been made, um, appreciate what is there, then start focusing a little bit. So you start, as, once you've established where you are and what you're photographing, photograph it. Then you start moving in. So this image, the past two images were shot with a wide angle lens, whereas this image was shot with a telephoto lens. And that's as techy as I'm gonna get today, just so you know. But if you can notice the difference between this, where it's really wide and you can see everything, whereas this image, everything, starts to layer upon itself. So that's just a different way of seeing a space. Okay, so try it when you're out next time. And you can do that on your phone as well. Uh, most of the new phones have like wide angle and telephoto on them. So play with it. And then continue to sort of establish where you are, start moving in. Um, this is, in the, this was actually last summer. It's not here this year because of um, closures, but um, in between the Freer Gallery and the Hopped Garden um, is this wonderful, in the summertime, this beautiful tropical paradise. And I would just take breaks there and have my lunch. And one day when I was eating, I looked up and I was just like, I feel like I'm in a completely different place. Like, this is amazing. So I just, photographed it. I just was sitting on the bench and just picked up my camera and shot what was in front of me. Um, and I kind of, I love this image. It's just tropical and, and not what you would see normally in DC. So start moving in, start noticing what you're, what you're looking at, start to focus on some details. Um, and one of them, especially in public gardens, is, is usually beautiful buildings or um, uh, plant pots and structures. So Start looking at how the garden interacts with the architecture there. Photograph some details. There's usually some sculpture and some really beautiful um, plant pots. Look at what's growing on things. Um, this is just like this beautiful blanket of moss that was growing on the side of this old wall. Um, and by really showing the wall and that moss and the light on it. Um, I just felt like that was a great representation of the place that I was in. Um, whereas if I was further back, you wouldn't notice the moss as much. You might sort of lose that detail. So get in close, start composing images in a way that is interesting to you. Um, photograph who lives there. Uh, we are all lucky sometimes to see beautiful butterflies flying through. Just be patient, be quiet, don't disturb them, but just 
let them be and they, they will usually deliver for you if you are patient. There's other bugs that exist. I'm not exactly sure. I think this is some type of milkweed bug. Cindy, you would know, but um, just start looking at the different colors and, and sort of the beauty that is, is in the, the things that live there as well, other than just the plants. Uh, when you're capturing details, start figuring out different ways to capture the exact same thing. So this is a really cool succulent wall that is in the Ripley Garden. And so I started out really far away, getting the whole thing, started moving in a little closer and closer and closer. So it's just four different views of the exact same thing. And it doesn't take a lot of effort to, to play with that, but at the end, you have all of these other options that you can choose from when you're, when you're editing or posting your pictures. So it's, it's fun, you always learn something. Look for texture. Um, I'm a big fan of foliage. I just love it. Um, all the different textures and patterns and just, you know, allow the chaos of the garden to just take over sometimes. Get in close on those flower petals, use some macro photography. We're not gonna get super into macro photography as a whole other beast um, today, but um, focusing in on the details is really fun. This is just from like a bouquet of flowers I had sitting on my table. Photograph the seasons. I mean, things change constantly in the garden. Start looking at that and inspecting that. This is at the Hershorn and Sculpture Garden. And the thing that I really enjoy about coming back to the same space is that not only the tree changes, but the sculptures change. So there was a different sculpture here and now there's these little balls and, and it, it just evolves constantly. So it's kind of an interesting way to document your space. And then if you are so excited about um, photography, start trying new things. Use um, different lights or take your uh, specimens inside and light them that way or bring like a piece of black paper to separate them from the background to highlight certain aspects. These are from the tree collection that we've been doing um, for the last two years. And I can't tell you how exciting it is to be in a little space with um, just one light and a reflector and a really close up lens. And you just start to see all kinds of details that you never notice um, when you're outside. So this is more of, you know, maybe an advanced move, but you can certainly give it a whirl. It's nothing stopping you. Look for patterns here too and rule of thirds. And finally, I would invite you to get really creative and just try something new. So this image um, of the hydrangea bloom is a dried one and I shot it on a flatbed scanner. Um, I just sprinkled some water on the flatbed scanner. Be careful. You don't want to, you know, leak it too much. But and then I just held it above the scanner and pressed scan. And that's what I got. I made it black and white, and, you know. But um, there's so many ways that you can photograph plants and, and um, there's really no end to the things that you can do. So I just wanna leave it with that and then um, just say again, um, breathe it in before you begin. Um, spend some time in the garden before you start photographing it. Challenge yourself to go beyond documenting what is in front of you. Um, try to photograph what it feels like to be in the garden and just always be present and play and experiment and just enjoy yourself. So with that, um, I guess we can go to questions. I will say that we are doing a, a photo challenge on Instagram if you are there and people are sharing images that they're making from these tips. We're doing tips every other Friday. Um, for the Instagram channel. And then um, if you're interested in the tree collection work, um, you can view that on the Smithsonian Gardens website and uh, navigate to Plant Explorer and you can find all kinds of pictures and lots of information about the trees that are in the collection. So with that,
Annalie, don't stop sharing. I think we should leave this slide up so people can uh, okay. see this information while we're asking questions. Sure. Uh, your photographs, I haven't been that quiet, this quiet in such a long time because I really got engrossed <laughs> in it. So I thank you for the magical <laughs> trip. Uh, it was wonderful. But I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask and even more popping up. And don't worry, people that are listening to us, if we don't get to your question right now, uh, we put together a resource page that we do answer the questions and it will be posted on our website when we post our, this video too. So you'll be able to go back and visit these tips and see them again and again and, and, and make improvements. But I think the most important question we got asked that I would like to ask you, are you born with a photographer's eye or do you think you can train to see the world as a photographer? I absolutely think that you can train yourself to see the world as a photographer. Um, yes, there's probably some hidden talent in a gene somewhere, but I trained for four years to be able to see this way and I've dedicated my life to seeing this way. So um, there's no reason anyone else couldn't do that. I wasn't born um, seeing the world this way. I developed it over a very long time. And um, I think the key is to just stay curious and be open to all kinds of different ideas. And um, yeah, just, just, just try, like, okay. <laughs> don't just automatically say that you can't take a picture. Like you absolutely can. We all started out in art class when we were kids and we all knew how to draw then. Like we all tried and we all played with it. So it's really more about just staying curious and playing. I like that answer because I, I feel the same way. We were not born gardeners, but we learned how to garden and we increase our knowledge every year that we do garden. So I, I feel the same way. Garden, if you're a gardener, it teaches you how to look at the world. Now just take that one step beyond and learn how to capture the world. And I think that's a, a great talent to use. So that, that's, that was, I thought, the most important question. But we had other questions. You didn't get into it, but, and, and I know there's different settings on the, the phone and the camera, the DSLR, that you can do it. How do you blur your backgrounds? Um, so when I'm shooting, the, the blur is um, by using a um, wide open aperture and some phones have that option, some do not. I mean, all, all cameras do. Um, that is one aspect of um, your exposure. So I do that by, you know, focusing on my subject and then setting my exposure so that my aperture can be in the range of like 2.8 to 5.6 for those that know what that means. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for those that don't, uh, and if you have a DSLR, those cute little pictures on your dial will enable you to do the same thing. So you can switch it to plant profile or, or, or cause mine has a little picture of a plant on it. There's a little picture of a person on it and that will do the same thing. So you can either know what your aperture is or uh, cheat with those little uh, pictures that are on your dial too. So I think that, that, that and you can also set your camera to aperture priority, which is mm -hmm. usually the A, and then you can select what the aperture is and then the camera will figure out the rest for you. Exactly. So a little bit more reading, but that's all right. There's lots available on, if you Google it, you'll, you'll get lots of advice, but we wanted to hear it from you too. So I also like the way that you were showing the rules but then break the rules. And I think that's what takes you and many other photographers up to the next level. So we're also worried about the rules, but you have to, and you have to learn them, but thank you for showing us how to break them and give us that, that feeling of creativity. So I think that's a good tip for everybody uh, to take home. Okay, <laughs> this is a, just a little tip because I, the horticulturist in me came out. The white paint on the bark is not to protect against insects, it's to protect, cracking in bright sun in the winter time because the bark would heat up and would crack. Uh, so that's to help reflect the light. So oh, okay. that was really a good observation on your point and I, I like your idea. Um, do you, tips for photographing plants for ID purposes. 
And I think they need to go on the Plant Explorer website to be able to see um, your photographs that you're taking to ID the, the, the tree or, or whatever else you're taking. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Um, you could absolutely go check out all the images we were making. Um, I think the key to the identification images is that um, you understand what is the important feature that you're photographing. And I have a wonderful team of people at Gardens that is helping me to understand that because I did not come into this um, position with a huge tree um, knowledge other than just loving them. So um, yeah, I think the important part, and I can go back quickly if I can, let me see. Um, oh no, we're not sharing anymore. But um, so those images that I showed of the leaf, like that was an important key feature of that tree. And um, so that's why it is isolated in that image. I think, mm -hmm. is that the question? <laughs> yep, no, that, that's a great. And I think uh, another part of that answer though is, and that's why I was alluding to, go look at your photographs in Plan Explorer, because I don't think there's a difference between IDing or taking a photograph to ID and taking a good photograph. You can still use that ID or, or use that photograph to ID a tree if it's a good photograph, unless you blur out everything. And then of course, I'm not gonna be able to tell what it is at all, but um, right. I, I think you a, do that great then. Focus mm -hmm. is an important feature for, yes. that, for sure. This is another little technical question and I'm actually curious about this too. Do you shoot in RAW and then work in Photoshop or do you shoot in JPEG? What is your uh, preferred method? Yeah, so I shoot everything in RAW. I don't shoot anything in JPEG because that is a lossy cap, um, thing that's very technical, but I always shoot in RAW and then process in Lightroom and Photoshop. Okay, and this is another, <laughs> not technical, but I think this will make everybody feel good. For every photo on the screen, how many did you have to take? <laughs> And then you threw them, well, that's why I like digital photography. Do I have to tell you? No. Um, no. <laughs> uh, several, several. Yeah, I mean, I definitely spend some time working around the subject to see what works the best. And usually I'm not checking while I'm in the field. I just am shooting. And then when I get home, I just pick what one I like best. Um, but yeah, I take many pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think everybody thinks that you take one shot and that's it. That's all you have to do. Then you walk away. That's only when you drop the mic after a good joke. The um, secret yeah. to a great photographer is being a good editor. <laughs> that's very good advice. Thank you. Um, another one, a little bit technical, but I think this one will be easier to take. What do you recommend? Two or three lenses or maybe even just one lens? Uh, and we talked about this in our practice session, one lens recommended for a newbie photographer, not a name, but a type. Uh, so. For gardens? Yeah. Specifically? Yeah. I think if I was new, I would probably, um, I mean, I prefer shooting with uh, prime lenses, which are just, you know, one focal length. But I think if I were new and just learning, I would get a zoom lens that was wide to telephoto, like telephoto, so that you could see what it looks like when it's wide, or like a wide angle view, and then start to move in closer. Um, so I, I think that might give you the most um, bang for your buck, is getting a nice zoom lens from maybe like 24 millimeter to 100 or something like that. Um, not so telephoto, like a zoomy that you don't know where to be, but um, <laughs> just, you know, a nice small zoom so that you can play around with the different options there. That, that's good advice because then you can walk around and you're not afraid of uh, changing things and doing everything else. You can just start with by observing and shooting and using that same lens to take multiple pictures of the same subject. That's very good advice. And I will say that most of the images in this show were shot with a 24 millimeter lens and a 100 meter millimeter macro lens. So mm -hmm. that, those are the two that I always have in my kit when I'm going out to shoot. 
So if you're a real newbie and you don't understand what that meant, go to your camera shop and they'll help you out. They'll point to what, what uh, Hanali just told us for the, the lenses that you want. So I'm looking now, oh, I know. So you said you use a re refractor or a reflector to be able to do light. Where do you position the reflector to be able to put more light onto the plant? Okay, so I'm gonna use my hands. So say the sun is coming from here and going this way. You would put the reflector here so that it's, the sun is bouncing off of it and hitting your subject, like I'm the subject. So I would put the reflector here. It's all opposite on my screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, the sun would come in, hit my, the side of my face here, and bounce off here, and then hit here. So it would fill in the shadows on my face. Excellent. And this is like the easiest thing is you could use a piece of paper, but I like foam core and there are definitely reflectors out there in the photo world that fold up and like become like these little circles that are really helpful to have. But this is a dollar, <laughs> you know, like you can just get out there and have something. You can also use it to block wind. If you're mm -hmm. photographing a flower, you can just put it next to the flower so that the wind isn't making it go all over the place. Um, that will help as well. Good advice. So it's a multi-use tool. What else do you need? I mean, yeah, that's fine. For a dollar. Yeah, for a dollar. I mean, you don't get much better. You can spend the money then on the lens and the camera and do that. <laughs> yeah, um, put your money there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that you were talking a lot about DSLRs, which is digital uh, single lens reflex camera, but could you tell us any tips at all for using a cell phone and how you could get your best images when that's the only camera you have in your hand? Yeah, so um, cell phones are great in that um, you always have them and they, they do focus really close to a, like if you had it on a flower, you can get really close to that flower and still get focus. And the way that you, I only use iPhones, so I don't know how it works on other phones, but for iPhones, if you touch the screen, like you have the screen and you touch it where you want it to focus, it will focus on what you touch. And then if you want to make the image brighter or darker, you just drag your finger up or down. You'll see little arrows and you just drag it up and down. That will change the exposure of your image. And that is very useful, um, especially on like sunny days and stuff like that. Um, so that, that would be the easiest, most um, helpful tip, I think, is just you use your finger to um, figure out what you want in focus. And then there's tons of apps that you can use to improve yeah. and edit and do that sort of thing yeah thank you and there's lots of google it i swear i spent oh. half of my day googling things including learning how to make webinars um, so it's almost the end of our time but i really wanted to thank you for coming on and the comments just go on and on so very very uh grateful for what you've taught us uh, they want another one where you talk about the technical aspects, so we'll have to think about that. But I want everybody to leave with this one thought, because someone asked, how do you design a garden to be able to take great photographs? What do you think? Oh, um, well, I am not a gardener, but, and I have a, a small garden in my backyard and probably half of the images from this presentation were from my own garden, which is, I wouldn't say beautiful, like it's, it's a work in progress. So, I mean, you can photograph anything if you get close enough to it. <laughs> um, yep. Flowers are beautiful and very interesting subjects. So I don't know, I, don't, I really don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I, tried, I didn't either. And that's right. I, I just think the best garden for photography is the garden that you're in because yeah, then you're going to know it better. Yeah. 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 I mean, you'll know the lighting and everything. So I think it's the garden that you're in is the best garden to take photographs in, especially during this time period of our lives. Yeah, of course. And, and you could photograph your house plants or if you get a beautiful bouquet in the mail or something, like photograph that. There's lots of there's lots of ways you can photograph plants and not have a beautiful, expansive garden. Agreed. But thank you so much for all your tips. 
and your beautiful, beautiful photographs that will keep us imagining how great we can grow as photographers ourselves. So thank you to everyone for joining us this week. We hope to see you next week when we'll show you glass lantern slides and tell you more that we didn't always have this digital stuff. There was another way that we used to be able to take pictures. So we'll share that information with you. And our webinars, just to let you know, will continue on through September. The listing is up on our website, so you can see what other subjects that we have. We're gonna take a little break in September, but then come back at the end of September. So more to come. We enjoy being with you, and we enjoy sharing our expert advice from all of our staff and employees at Smithsonian Gardens. Have a good day. Bye. Mm -hmm.